So, we're in the studio. You have your script written. You have it printed up. And we will have that on the desk. Now, I'm going to go through all of these uh, tips about teleprompter and uh, reading off the teleprompter and announcing. Again, I'm going to record it here in a minute, but everything I'm going to show you is how I would like you to kind of carry yourself as well on the day that you come in and practice and then tape. So when we come in, now I'm going to, this is going to be just a single camera shoot. I'm by myself, so normally we would have the two chairs side by side for you and your partner. The microphones are right here. The lavalier microphones, which you're familiar with from this is a camera. They should always be hanging over the back of one of the chairs. That doesn't always happen. But why do we want it there? There's no other place really to keep it where that, that's probably the safest place. We don't want to have it on the desk because what will happen is it will start sliding and dragging and blow the ears out of the people in there if it's not muted. Okay? We don't want to drop it on the floor because then that's when someone can step on it or put the chair on it or move it around and break it. They're very delicate. Okay? And so when we're done with it or where you should find it should always be on the back of the chair. Okay? And if you guys in the back, if you can't see me behind that camera, you might want to come over here because there's going to be some different things I'm going to do as well that you might not be able to see all the way in the back. Okay, so how do we mic ourselves up? It will be easiest the day of recording and then maybe even when you practice to have something with a collar or a lapel. Hoodies, t-shirts do not work very well at all. Because what we want to do anytime we use these kinds of microphones in broadcast is to hide the microphone wire. Because if we don't hide it, <coughs> it sticks out. It's like a sore thumb. I mean, that's like the first thing you noticed. So again, we want to eliminate distractions. So I can run it through my jacket. I can run it through a shirt, through a sweater. And now you don't even see, you're going to see the microphone. That's fine. But you're not going to see that big, long wire, OK? So on the day of recording, I would wear something with a collar or a jacket, something with a lapel, even like this, okay? This isn't even formal, but at least it's easy to hook up to, okay? When I go to sit in my chair, I'm moving the desk so you all can see. I don't want to use the back of it. I don't want to sit like this. This is how we normally sit. And why don't I want to sit like this? You're slouching. You're too casual. And when you're too casual, you're not credible. Your audience will be like, what is this guy doing? So what do I want you to do? I want you to sit on the edge of your seat, OK? Just like this. So then you don't have the crutch of the back of it. And you have to sit up straight. Now I'm sitting up straight, and I'm going to look forward. Not only is my posture just straight and non-distracting, it's pretty neutral. It's also going to help me project. Because if I'm back here, this is kind of how I'm going to talk. And it's going to be kind of, this is, you know, way too casual. But if I'm forward, I'm automatically just going to project a little bit differently because I know it's just kind of a little bit of an awkward feeling. It's going to feel a little awkward. And that's okay. Most of what you're going to do here is going to feel a little bit awkward. Okay? I've been doing this for 20 plus years. It still feels awkward for me when I do it, but I'm just used to it. Okay? All right. Okay, so I'm on the edge of my chair. What do I do with my hands and my arms? Where do they go? Oh my gosh, I don't know what to do with them. Uh, there's two things that I would recommend that you can do with them. One is have them under the desk. Under the desk, is, is, I look very neutral now again. Doesn't look awkward, doesn't look distracting, just looks pretty plain. And that's good. The other thing you could do with your hands is have them on the top of the desk, just like this. And they'd be on my script. The tips of my fingers would be on my script so that, again, my script is not stapled. We're going to have it side by side. So as I'm reading, okay, off the prompter, my part is over. My partner is reading their, their news story. What am I going to do? This kind of goes into nonverbals. We'll go through here in a minute, but you know, off camera, what am I doing? Where are my hands? 
one of the best things you can do is kind of have your finger on the next story that you are going to read. So you're kind of reading it on your script as you're looking up, preparing for the next one that's going to come up so that you are ready to go. Okay. Now you'll all already be very familiar with your script because you're going to practice a lot. I'm going to have you practice a lot today and all of next week we're going to practice. You'll have practiced so much you'll be like, I can't practice anymore. Tough. You're going to keep practicing because that's the only way to get better. Um, and you'll practice here and you'll practice all around and on your own so that by the time you come to taping, you will know your script so well um, that the words right there, are gonna, that's half the battle of reading off a teleprompter, knowing your script. Okay? That being said, my hands can be right here. I can kind of be following along. My partner's reading their story. Mine's coming up next. Now I'm looking up. Now I'm ready to go. Okay? I'm done with my first page. I can just slide it off to the side. If it were stapled, you know, <laughs> and that's going to be picked up right here in the microphone. You don't want that. This way, not stapled, flat on the table. I can just slide it right over like that, and I'm ready to go. Okay? So that's where your hands should be, either right here on your script, on the edge of the table, or underneath the table. What you don't want to do is this. Elbows on the table and my hands folded like this. This looks very proper. I call this spaghetti fingers. This looks like a big bowl of spaghetti in the foreground of the shot and people's eyes are gonna be immediately drawn to your spaghetti hands. We don't want that, that's distracting, okay? You don't want like this because it looks like you're gonna jump through the camera and hurt me, okay? We don't want that either. <laughs> you just wanna do as much as you can to be simple and neutral. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so let's go through some of these tips here a little bit, all right? Uh, the first and foremost, uh, the prompter is going to maintain your pace. It's a common myth and, and uh, misconception that if you start going too fast reading, it's because the prompter's going too fast, or um, you can't go fast enough because they're going too slow in there. Um, experienced teleprompter operators maintain the pace of the announcer. And that's why I had you guys just practice that and try and follow along with the pace of the announcing in This Is A Camera. Because that you, the announcer, set the pace, not the other way around. So um, in order to do that, you need to, again, understand your script and then maintain a casual, natural speaking pace. Not dozens of foreign insects and plant disease slipped into the United States in the years of 9-11. Uh, Reports indicate, okay, we're not plowing through it like that. We're also not going dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases. We're not doing that either. The best way I can describe it is this. How do you talk to your friends in a casual, quiet, private in, in environment? It's real natural. Dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected into the United States. That's how I would have a conversation with Mrs. Davidson or somebody else just almost in passing. That's kind of the, the mentality that you need to have. Now that's a hard mentality to maintain because there's very bright hot lights on me. There are um, 18 faces looking at me. Uh, will be recording me, and I am being recorded. I know I have a microphone on. I'm sitting on the edge of my chair. I have papers all in front of me. This is really awkward. So what do you have to do? You got to kind of trick your brain a little bit, okay? You got to tell yourself, casual, casual, be casual. Remind yourself, be casual, okay? And there's a few things we'll go through there in a minute. Um, okay, let's see. Before the shoot, must have a printed version. We've covered that um, at nauseum. Now, Here's the trick, and here's where uh, when we go to practice later today and on front of the camera, I want you guys to be aware of um, names, pronunciation of words. The only way really to know how that's going to sound is to speak it out loud. And you can't really do that in the lab. Some of you said, oh yeah, we already practiced reading it out loud and timed it in front of your computer. That's not the environment you're going to be recording in. So the only way you can practice the way it's going to be somehow you're going to record is to somehow uh, simulate the environment that you are going to record in. We're not recording in there. We're going to be recording in here. So that's why I'm going to give you enough time. Tuesday, this is all we are going to do. 
Whoever's ready to go, whether their script is 100% or not, we're going to throw it on the prompter and I'm going to let you get in front of here and just practice. Okay? But pronunciations are the number one thing that can trip you up. Foreign names, words you're unsure of, you know, longer, bigger words, which is why we don't use them. Um, when you go back and look at your script, write them out phonetically, write out numbers, write out things, doesn't matter, write it how you think it should be spelled for how it sounds because spelling doesn't matter, Pronunciate, or um, punctuation doesn't matter because who's seeing the script? You are, okay? And you have to write it for easiness. And one of the biggest things is if you have a word that will trip you up on the prompter, it can trip you up for the rest of the newscast because now you're thinking about it. Like, oh my God, I just messed that up. So you have to try and remove as much of that possibility, okay, as you can. So when you go to write your script, number one, make sure you can pronounce all your words and make sure you're using casual language instead of use weave, contractions, instead of we have and haven't instead of have not. Um, we have and have not is more formal. We don't want formal. We want casual. Okay? So contractions are okay. Um, number two, practice, practice, practice. We just covered that. You're going to be doing a ton of that. Number three, passion and energy. This is a huge part of being successful on air. If there's two parts to it, this is the other half. The first half is a written script, right? I've talked to you about this a lot, and I'll keep talking about it. A successful production is only as successful as it's writing. If it's written well, it has got a chance to be successful. The other half of that is passion and energy. And so with all of these distractions and all of these new things coming, kind of coming at you, and you're trying to focus on the prompter, that starts taking away passion. That starts taking away energy. You're so focused on the words on the prompter Again, you have to kind of trick yourself. And so what I tell um, uh, you guys and my, even my advanced students who do this every month is to, and if anyone's an actor, they kind of get this, overact, over-enunciate, over-pronounce in your head is what you'll be doing. But when it comes out on camera, it's going to seem really natural. And you're going to say, Mr. Goebel, I'm like screaming this. This is so bizarre. This is just this doesn't make sense. You know, I'm just... This is so not natural. In your head, it's not going to be natural. But to the rest of us, Hiyabu, it's going to be really natural. Because if you read it how you think it should be and natural in your mind, you're going to have this face. You're going to have the frozen head and these eyes. Dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected. And everyone in the control room working is going to say, this, Mr. Goble wants to hurt us. <laughs> that person wants to hurt us. They're, it's going to look so unnatural. But in your mind, it's natural. So as you're practicing, over-pronunciate. Over-enunciate. And I'm going to show you some other t tricks here in a minute. It's going to feel really awkward, but it's going to look natural on camera. Trust me. Um, okay, smile. Smiling is huge. Some of us don't like to smile. Tough, you're going to smile in this ex exercise. Because smiling looks pleasing on camera. It lightens your face. If I don't smile, it looks like the person's going to come through and hurt you. Or they're so upset, they're just not happy to be there. Smile. It lightens your face. These are some of the nonverbals that you have to maintain on camera. Because if you don't, the other nonverbals of the stone face that Hiyabu is giving me right now will be so noticeable, that's what people will notice. Trust me, it won't, you won't be paying attention to the person reading. You'll be watching Hiyabu's face like, what is wrong with Hiyabu? Is what you'll be saying if that's the face he has. Trust me on that. So you have to smile. Smiling also um, allows you to inflect. It allows you to create some more energy. It allows you to create some more passion. Notice how my voice is all of a sudden a little more active because I'm smiling as I'm telling you this. That's just how our bodies react, and that looks good on camera. Okay. Now, that being said, if it's a sad story, 
of course you don't want to smile during that sad story. You have to maintain the proper nonverbals through the tone of the story because then that can be just as distracting. If you're talking about a house fire, you know, where people died and you're smiling, oh my gosh, right? What are you doing? However, you know you can always smile in the intro. You can always smile in the close. You can always smile during sports. You can always smile during weather. There's half of your newscast that you know you're going to be smiling, okay? And so, and you may through the other stories too, but you always do want to maintain the tone. So if it is a serious story, a sad story, you don't have to have a sad face. That is where you do want the neutral face. That's where you just want to be, look confident, um, neutral, draw, draw no attention to your nonverbals, okay? But smiling is very important. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Number five, should be on the back. Maintain eye contact. And if you watched the example that I showed you a couple times, the anchors looked off to the side like that. Um, we have the teleprompters, and professional stations have prompters directly on the camera for a reason. And that reason is because that camera, I'm looking right at that camera. That camera is my friend. That is the person that I'm talking to. That is one person. Because behind that one person, hopefully, are thousands or millions of people watching. And I am making eye contact directly with each one of them through their television or through their computer or device or whatever they have. And that eye contact, like any good conversation, if you maintain eye contact, number one, you look credible, you look serious, you look like you know what you're talking about, you look engaged. Imagine when you have conversations with your parents or a teacher or anybody and they don't look at you. They're looking down. They're looking around. How does that appear? What is that telling you? They're not interested, they don't care, they don't want to look at me. I mean, it's all negative stuff. So eye contact suggests credibility and you want to maintain that eye contact with your audience because the, other, the, the last part of this is if I'm maintaining eye contact and all of a sudden there's a noise in the control room and I do this, they're not going to be listening to my partner reading, the, you know, announcing the story. They're going to say, why did Mr. Goble just look off camera? This will always be more noticeable than what should be most noticeable. Does that make sense? That's just how we, as human beings, see things. That's what will happen. So always maintain eye contact. Now with that, the eye contact and you're focusing so hard on reading off the teleprompter because you've never done this before, what does that do? That decreases what? Your energy, your passion your smile. So it's hard. Okay, this is a skill you have to kind of really fight through. So don't just try not to allow yourself to do that. How do you get past that? How do you get past um, or how do you get to where you can focus eye contact and smile and maintain energy? Practice. Practice. It's the only way. That is the only way. You can trick yourself until you get there, you know, to work on some techniques I'm going to give you here momentarily, but it's to practice. Okay, number six, and we've already talked about this now. Use nonverbal communication. It's amazing to me, but it's true. The nonverbal communication speaks louder than the verbal words that you guys will write in your script on, in a television broadcast. That's a fact. The nonverbals are louder than whoever is actually speaking because that's just where our eyes are drawn to what somebody else is doing. How do they look? Are they twitching? Are they tapping on the, you know, the table? Are they, are they moving around? You know, are they, they have a little nervous? We all have little nervous ticks. You know, that'll come out on camera, and we'll work on that as well for how our years are. So um, be very mindful of what your nonverbals are. The way to find out what your nonverbals are in this setting is to practice. practice. Um, one other nonverbal I haven't mentioned yet. So you're with a partner sitting next to you. And let's say, and I'm going to use Elliot, you're up here and you're announcing. One of the more, most common things as we, you know, new broadcasters will do, as Elliot is reading dozens of foreign insects, I'm sitting over here reading it along with him, but like to myself, like I, and my lips are kind of moving. Uh, be very careful. We'll, we'll ha that'll happen. 
So just be very careful of that. You can read along, but read along with your eyes, not with your lips, okay? Um, number seven, don't shout. Just like we don't want to be too quiet, we can't read like this, because if we're like this, this suggests that we're not confident. We don't know what we're, we're not, we're unsure. Um, there's no credibility, people won't listen. You also don't want to shout, because if you shout, we had the microphone level, and now Ms. Davidson is going to need, you know, ear surgery, because I just blew out her eardrums. And she nods her head. So don't shout. That's why when we go to do a microphone check, we're going to want you to read and announce the way you are actually going to do it so that we can set a normal, casual level and maintain that, okay? Um, number eight, don't follow the teleprompter. So what does that mean? You will follow the words on the prompter with your eyes, not your head. Because here's, here's the difference. If I follow it with my head, how you don't want to do it. Dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected into the United States in the years after 9-11. Did you guys see that? It's weird. Yeah, it's distracting. It's just weird. So you want to follow with your eyes. This is a hard thing to do because how are we trained to read? We're trained to read with our eyes. And what words are we trained? And if you guys even remember this, it's so second nature. And my son is going through it right now. He's six in kindergarten learning how to read. They do go one word at a time, and then in first grade, they try to teach you to skip ahead to the next word, anticipate the next word. So when it says dozens of foreign insects, I'm saying dozens, but my eyes are already jumping ahead to foreign insects. You cannot do that, again, on a teleprompter. What does that do? It makes you speed up, it makes you run words together, and it'll trip you up. It'll do nothing but mess you up. But that's how we've been doing it now for 12, 13, 14, 15 years, however long. Now what are we going to do? You almost have to go back to how my son, who is five, is learning how to read and go one word at a time and still make it sound casual and conversational. It's tough. So what you do is your eye is only focusing on the word that you are saying, and it actually will sound fine. So dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected into the United States in the years after 9-11. Okay, so there's some other additional tricks, but the first one is to only allow your eye to focus on the word that you're supposed to be saying at that time. Don't let it jump ahead to the, the next words, because you'll see, I can see, what is it, 10, 15, 20 words on the teleprompter right now. That can look confusing and jumbled. So again, you have to practice to train to read just the one word. Um, the other part of this is be confident that the words will always be there. So if the teleprompter is having a problem, the operator, they're going, they are, you know, it's stuck or they're starting to go too fast. They aren't keeping up with you because um, they don't know how to operate it, whatever the case may be. Two things, trust that the words will show back up on the prompter, okay, that there will be somebody in the control room, a director or a production assistant who will get things back on track. And always know you have your script in front of you, okay? So that if something does go wrong with that, you always have this, okay? Um, one final part to that, the last bullet point, when you pause or even improvise, your next word will always be there on the prompter. Here's the other thing pauses can do. Pauses add um, inflection, emphasis, and it allows your eyes to only focus on the one word at a time. Because if I don't pause, here's how it'll sound like, and I allow my eye to jump forward, it'll sound like this. Dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected into the United States in the years after 9-11. That's just not natural. I did no pause and no inflection. Now I'm gonna pause and inflect, and you'll be able to see and hear the difference in how I'm presenting it to where as you, the viewer, want to hear it, you may actually remain interested. Dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected into the United States in the years after 9-11. So that pause is slight, right? But I offered inflection, and so now you're like, oh, really? Rather than, what did he just say? Number nine, 
another huge, huge thing, don't panic, ever. Don't ever panic. Um, you try to do everything you can to eliminate things that may trip you up. You try to do everything so that the prompter works and that everyone behind the camera is doing everything they're supposed to do. You try to write your script as seamlessly and practice as much as possible. But guess what? Problems always happen. You will slip up on a word. You will mess up. Someone else will mess up that will trip you up. Someone will laugh in the background and distract you. Um, it happens to the pros all the time. But the biggest thing you can't do is panic. And here's why. If I panic, if I trip up on doesn't a for foreign, foreign, okay, what does that do? That's kind of how we naturally react. Like, oh, I can't believe I just messed up. Now I just did that on camera and everyone's going to be talking about this guy is a maniac. Okay? All you can do is plow through it. Act like it didn't happen. Ignore it. And they may still focus on it a little bit, but within seconds, your audience will totally forget about it. So dozens of, for dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped unde undetected into the United States in the years after 9-11. Reports indicate, so they'll be like, he totally just messed up. But as I keep going, you'll kind of forget about it. Okay? So don't panic. Don't draw attention to your mistakes. Mistakes are going to happen. And don't compound it by drawing attention to it, okay, by through nonverbals or, or you're screwing up in there, you know, while we're broadcasting. That doesn't work. And that kind of goes to number 10. Enjoy and have fun. This is television. This is not the end of the world. And for this activity, this is supposed to just be fun. And if you treat it just as fun, that will hopefully help your passion, your energy, your smile. Um, to not be nervous. This, the number one thing, and I don't know, if you guys know Jerry Seinfeld, this comedian Jerry Seinfeld. Hopefully, he, he, you know him. Um, he has a bit where he says, and, and this is true, that um, the, the number one fear of people uh, in the world is public speaking. People have a natural fear. That's the number one fear of people is public speaking. You know what the number two fear is? Huh? Death. So he jokes, people would rather be in the box than giving the eulogy, which is kind of, who's behind us, Helene? You get that? Yeah. So this is a great practice just to public speak, but have fun with it. Because you, you'll, for 20 plus years that I've been doing this, I'll go do an interview, and 99% of the time, I look terrible on camera. I don't know what, I, I, I can't, I, you know, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't speak. And that's okay. That's your, so number one, to get past that in your life is huge. If you just don't have any fear of this stuff, you won't have any fear of, of a lot of things. But the other thing is it's television. It's fun. Okay. It's fun to be on camera. It's fun to kind of have all this stuff going on. Okay. And if it's going to make you feel totally awkward and uncomfortable and that's okay. It does for everybody when you first start doing this. Um, and if you don't even ever want to get into this, that's fine too. But if you can get behind these lights and in front of that camera and record for two minutes, that is a huge success. Whether you think you're good or not, okay, that's a huge success. So I want you to have fun with this. Just totally have fun with it the day we record, okay? All right. I went through a lot. I gave you a lot of techniques. I don't want to speak too much longer. I do want to do, I want to model just a very, I have three short stories I want to model with a couple more techniques, but are there any questions about any of it? Did I fill you with too much? Okay. Um, so we talked about where our eyes should be focusing on, which is where. On, if I'm on the prompter, my eyes are on the prompter, what am I looking at? Yeah. At the camera. And on that camera and on that prompter, what am I focusing on as I'm announcing? Single word, Single word at a time. Okay. To do that, typically, we get what's called the frozen head, where I don't move my head. Now, Sam, have, we haven't known each other too long, but in, in the time that I've talked with you, have I talked with you like this, where my head is not moved whatsoever, and I've maintained eye contact with you and not moved my head at all? Nope. If I would have done that, what would you have thought? I don't know. I'm thinking pretty weird. <laughs> exactly. 
We don't talk like that. How do we talk? Our heads move. They, and we don't even know it. They naturally move. But when we get behind the camera and we're focusing on these 10 other things I just told you, our head gets frozen. So in the same way that I'm going to have you kind of over-act, over-pronunciate, over-enunciate, pause, I'm actually going to force you to move your head too. Because forcing you to move your head, which is going to feel, Eric, it's going to feel so awkward. Trust me, you're going to be like, Mr. Goble, this is, this is weird. That's okay. It's going to be weird to you, and it's going to look normal to us on the other side of the camera. So how do we do that? We're going to move our chin slightly at the beginning of every sentence and slightly at the end of every sentence. Notice what happens when I go slightly at the beginning. My voice goes up and slightly at the end. It comes down a little bit, not too high, not too low. Um, it's not a bobblehead because that looks really weird too. It's just slight. So I'm going to go a little bit here and a little bit there at the beginning of every sentence. And I may even add a little bit in between because I've been doing this a long time and I, it feels really weird to me when I do it, but I know it just looks like I'm actually speaking to somebody. Okay. So at minimum, I want you guys at the beginning and at the end to slightly move your chin. This will do two things. When we read, um, and I even remember this back, you know, uh, in school when we'd be like in middle school, uh, Don, why don't you read paragraph one for the class? Okay. Dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected into the United States in the years after 9-11. Reports indicate government authorities have been so focused on preventing another attack that they overlooked a pest explosion that threatened the quality of the nation's food supply. We start really high and we end really low and we trail off and we have no idea what we're saying in between. Okay? So by moving your head, this will hopefully do a couple things to your volume and help with inflection. If I start really high, I'm going to end really low, and I'm going to trail off. Bad. If I start really low, I'm going to probably end up really high. Weird. Start kind of in the middle, like this volume right here. Dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected in the United States in the years after 9-11. It went a little bit up. It went a little bit down, but it mostly stayed right in the middle, right? That's where I want you guys to practice and live. So you guys may already, well, we've already practiced reading it out loud. I believe you. You probably practiced it like this. Dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected. The United States in the four, and that's what we call sing-songy. Sounds like a sing-song. We're songing, we're singing. It's going up and down and up and down. We don't want that. Level, plain, neutral, okay? And if you do that, that offers you opportunities when you pause then to inflect on words throughout the sentence and it just sounds more interesting. So when I say to talk with your head, that's what I mean. Okay? I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm missing out. Nobody has any questions about any of that. Does that make anybody nervous? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Uh, I don't know if Ms. Davidson can hear me. Ms. Davidson, can you hear me by chance? Awesome. Would you be available to run the prompter for a minute? Awesome. No, if you're ready, I'll just, if you want to just start it when I go, when I start reading. Okay. Dozens of foreign insects and plant diseases slipped undetected into the United States in the years after 9-11. Reports indicate government authorities have been so focused on preventing another attack that they overlooked a pest explosion that threatened the quality of the nation's food supply. Consequences face consumers in the form of higher grocery prices, substandard produce, and the risk of environmental damage from chemicals needed to combat the pests. Seven people not wearing life vests treaded water in choppy seas for 20 hours before being rescued off the Florida Keys coast. U.S. Coast Guard officials said an 80-year-old woman drowned, but a four-year-old girl was among those saved. The tourist boat capsized and sank at around noon on Saturday. The Milwaukee Brewers took game one of the NLCS yesterday, beating the St. Louis Cardinals 9-6. A sixth-run fifth inning put the Brewers in the lead. They never surrendered. St. Louis and David Freeze belted a three-run homer in the fourth to give the Cardinals a 4-2 lead at that point. 
The Brewers and Cardinals will meet again Monday night at Miller Park for Game 2. The first pitch is set for 7.05. Okay, observations, questions, thoughts? Yes. Okay, so we have like 20 seconds for each of our news stories. Yes. If we take this long pause, like how are we going to be in those 20 seconds? Good question. How would you be? You have to really shorten your scripts. And that's where you're getting into the most important information in that 20 seconds. So the timing, so it's not all about plowing through the information to your audience. It's about delivering the most important information in the most interesting way. So that if you only get to three of those facts, but it was really interesting, what, what call to action might that viewer then take? Celine, what might that, so you say a story in, in 20 seconds, but you only got through three or four major facts of a big deal. What do you think that viewer might do then? They may go online, they may tune in later, they may flip over to our affiliate station, they may tune into like, you know, MSNBC, to, you know, for the interview with one of the authorities. Their call to action may be to, to one of my other stations, one of my other par partner networks, or to my website online, my television website online, for a more in-depth part of the story. Okay. And is that a good thing? Yep. Absolutely. Okay, because what I typically might do, and what a lot of newscasters do at the end of these headline newscasts, for more in-depth coverage, check out ksdk.com, or, you know, so they'll kind of give you a place to go to, to get, to get further, you know, interviews, or tune into MSNBC tonight for the full interview with, you know, Keith Olbermann, your host, even though he's not there anymore. Okay, so they'll, they'll do some cross-promotion. So in a headline newscast, they will um, direct the audience where they can go to later to one of their other programs for more in-depth information. That's kind of what we hope for in these headline newscasts. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Rest of the class today, what should you be doing? Writing your scripts, writing your news briefs, making sure they're formatted, and then practice, practice, practice. If anyone is not ready for the teleprompter yet, but you would like to at least come up and sit here and just kind of put yourself in that, feel free to do so. Feel free to move around into 251 for some privacy. Go out into the hall, go back into the teleconference room, find a quiet, private area so that you can practice some of these things now that I've given you to do that are going to feel really weird and awkward at first. Okay? And then for Tuesday, plan for this. Uh, there's a very specific way we have to uh, save and then transfer our scripts from um, either Google or Word uh, into the teleprompter. So I'll show you how to do that on Tuesday. And I would really try to prepare myself to get here on Tuesday, at least once, if not twice, to practice on Tuesday in front of the camera with the lights on. Okay? That's kind of my hope and my goal.